Hello, I'm Dr. Mark Gannon, the director of the Low Vision Institute in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I want to talk about solutions in low vision. When a patient has lost a lot of vision, there are a number of different avenues or modes of approach that we can take to try to get them back some visual function or some function in general. One of the more common approaches is what we call an adaptive compensatory strategy. And there's a number of groups throughout the country doing adaptive compensatory therapy. And what we mean by that is if somebody has lost a level of vision, they're taught to utilize some other ways or means to function without utilizing vision as part of the equation. For instance, if you lost vision and could no longer cook in the kitchen, you would be taught how to mark the stove or oven with two little dots that you could feel. And when you turn the dial on the stove until it was 350 degrees, for instance, you would know when the stove was on and set at 350, and you would then be able to cook. That enables you to function and restores a level of, of confidence that you didn't have before and gives you the ability to cook, which you couldn't do before. We call these things activities of daily living, and they're necessary for survival. So adaptive compensatory strategies are predominantly low vision survival skills. They're ways to adapt to your loss of vision and compensate with a different sensory modality. In the example I just gave you, that would be the, the uh, modality or sensitivity of, of touch. So you'd be able to utilize touch to compensate for your loss of vision in order to be able to set the oven and, and cook in the kitchen. In, an, in a restorative mode, we would take the same patient and we would find areas of tissue in the retina or the eye that were still functional and healthy. We would then design a little low vision device, such as a telemicroscope, and when they put the telemicroscope on and were appropriately taught to utilize it in the healthy tissue they had remaining in their eyes together, they would then be able to walk into the kitchen, look at the dial on the stove, and set it for 350 because, in fact, they would be seeing it. So this is a restorative low vision approach, which really incorporates the word vision, whereas the other adaptive compensatory approach doesn't incorporate sight. When we incorporate vision into the equation, we can again do all of the things or many of the things that are visually related. We can read, we can write, we can play cards, we can watch television, all of those things that we couldn't do if we were to compensate with a different sensory modality that wouldn't give us those abilities and capabilities. When we're dealing with vision, there are a number of different aspects that become very important. Resolution, contrast, glare, and lighting are among the most important. Light's a very important entity especially if we're trying to compensate using vision or using an optical form of correction, such as glasses or simple telescopes or telemicroscopes. And I'll show you some of those in a couple minutes. But when we try to compensate using light, it's important to understand how light actually functions. When we're talking about contrast, if we were in a dark room, we would be bumping around into everything because there wouldn't be anything we could see. So a total lack of light is, of course, very detrimental and harmful. If we bring the light up in the room, we can see what's in the room. Concurrently, if we're walking outside and we look up at the sky in broad daylight, we see the sun, but we're unaware of the fact that the sky is filled with stars. And at night, of course, it's filled with stars because the sun isn't out and there's enough light in the background for the star to come through, but the background beyond that is dark. And when we add extra light in the daytime, it drowns out the stars and we can't see them. So they get lost in the shuffle. So just as not enough light is dangerous or bad for us, too much light can also be harmful. When we're talking about lighting levels, there are a number of different things that come into play. The wavelength or frequency of the light is very important in bringing out contrast and colors. So we have to have appropriate lighting levels and appropriate wavelength to get the contrast and resolution levels we need. And if we have lights of an inappropriate type, such as incandescence, we have a lot of heat generated by the light. It's frequently thought by patients and doctors alike sometimes that if a 100-watt bulb doesn't produce enough illumination on the page for us to read, that we need to get a 300-watt bulb and we'll resolve the problem. Not true. That 300 watts goes to the entire room. So even though you have a brighter bulb, the bulb isn't directed toward the task at hand. And lighting up the whole room isn't what we need to do. For instance, a 300-watt bulb in a lamp that's 30 inches away from the reading material may only produce two or three units of light on the page, whereas a, a lamp that's far lower in wattage, maybe 50 or 60 watts, may produce a much more effective light on the page and give us seven to 10 units of light if it's appropriately directed. So directing the light becomes a very important aspect of it as well. If we can balance the uh, wavelength of the light 
as well as the wattage or power of the light to the optimum level, we have the most comfortable level of reading and contrast and can then function at the highest level of, of efficiency. And uh, uh, Dr. John Ott had done this for us many years ago. He started out working for Disney in Ohio, where he was contracted to uh, work with the Cinderella movie and show time-lapse photography of the growth of a pumpkin so that it could appropriately be integrated into the Disney movie Cinderella. And when that was first done, he found that as he started growing the pumpkins, they would die or they wouldn't reach maturity. So he couldn't complete the sequence. By adjusting the light frequencies, he noticed a big change in the response of the pumpkins and ultimately was able to grow the pumpkins appropriately, denoting the tremendous effect that the appropriate wavelength of light has on living tissue, including the eye. So when we're able to balance that out appropriately, we get or become much more functional in terms of the way that we work. Uh, the eye light itself was a light developed uh, through that technology where through a great deal of, of testing and research, it was determined that a very specific wavelength of light, 508 nanometers, accompanied by the appropriate strength or power of the wattage of the lamp itself would give us the ability to comfortably and efficiently and effectively read. We integrate these lamps into our program and they come in a number of different shapes and sizes and styles. But most importantly, the technology and the wavelength of the light and the light source itself are fairly consistent throughout, giving us the ability to uh, gain the resolution that we need when we correct a patient optically in a low vision scenario. When we're dealing with low vision devices, I kind of use the analogy of, ocup of, of orthopedic surgery. If a patient was to lose a leg, they would have four basic choices. They could remain in bed and do nothing. They could learn to use a wheelchair, which is relatively easy to learn to use and gets them around a bit. They could learn to use crutches, giving them a little more latitude, or they could learn to use a prosthetic leg, which actually gives them the most latitude and, and moving about and, and is the most natural. Not everybody that loses a leg can have a prosthesis. Some people don't have upper body strength or, or balance, and, and we have to put them in a wheelchair. But it's kind of a shame to put somebody in a wheelchair that could otherwise be up walking around. What we try to do is develop devices that the patient can wear in the form of, of glasses. And, and these may be devices that look like small telescopes or telemicroscopes, such as the one I'm holding here in my hand. And these are worn just like a regular pair of glasses would be worn. And in its normal form, it gives us distance vision. So we can sit and watch television or see people's faces across the room and function. And as long as they're utilized appropriately with the right lighting, we get the greatest benefit from the device itself. And we use these devices, again, more like a prosthetic. They give the patient a lot more capability to read and write, see up close and far, cook in the kitchen, and do all of these varied activities without being dependent on some other sensory modality to compensate for their loss of vision. And uh, at the Institute, these are the ways and means that we like to utilize as much as possible. The device I just showed you was a telemicroscope used for reading and in intermediate distances and can't be used for mobility. If you were to walk around with that device, you'd fall or trip because the field of view is relatively small as far as mobility and seeing things in front of you on the floor. We do have other devices, such as these little bioptic telescopes, which are two small scopes mounted in the top part of a pair of glasses. And in fact, these are mobility devices. In 36 states, they're approved for driving in the United States right now and to meet the driver's license requirements in those states. And when these are worn, the patient basically looks through their regular prescription in the intermediate portion of the lens and through a bifocal if we incorporate it in the bottom to give them some ability to read or see up close. But when they want to sight something in the distance, they have a tiny telescope in the top and simply drop their head, bringing the telescope into function and whatever they're looking at becomes two or three times closer and two or three times larger. So things that are 300 feet away appear to be 100 feet away, making traffic lights and signs or people's faces or the flag across a golf course much easier to see and identify. And uh, they're utilized as mobility devices. So we have different levels of things that we need to do or incorporate as solutions for patients with low vision that actually give us the ability to restore visual function. We don't have to be dependent on adapting to our loss and compensating, utilizing some other sensory modality. So once again, remember, there is new hope in sight, and thank you very much.